Statistically speaking, most people who watch this channel are old enough to have lived on the waning days of film photography. At least enough of it to not take for granted how easy it is to take a photograph. Sure, we didn't need exploding balls for flash, and you could take up to 36 shots per roll of film, but there was still some ways to go where we could absent-mindedly capture a high-resolution snapshot of our lunch. Photography was the next big frontier in recording history. You know, once we had figured out how to mass copy text and became able to quickly recreate illustrations. Its democratization allowed everyone to capture events exactly as they were, inasmuch as the technology at the time permitted it. Yet it costs only $74, or as little as $7.50 down. By the 1960s, anyone with $30 in their pocket can get something to record their special occasions. Drop in a film, get yourself a flash cube, pop it on, take one, take two, take three, take four flash pictures without changing bulbs. 60 years later, our cameras are much better and our albums infinite. It's been a thrill to see the transition. Shout out to everyone that lived in that bit of time where digital cameras were the default, but cloud storage wasn't. May the photos sacrificed to the ether and failing proprietary storage cards given you joy in their brief and glorious existence. But if you didn't want to deal with memory cards back in the day, there were still Minilabs. Developed in the 1970s by Japanese conglomerate Noritsu, Minilabs turned the development of photography from something done by someone in a dark room with a turnover that could be measured in days, to something that you could get in a small booth next to the supermarket in less than an hour. These places were creatively known as one-hour photo places. The movie of the same name has little to do with them. One Hour Photo is an excellent snapshot of 2002, and not just because of the main character's employment where 2002 is pretty near the last possible moment where some of the things that give him purpose would exist. It's a very nice camera. Really? Mm. Because Will's been trying to get me to go digital and I'm... Oh, don't do that. I'd be out of a job. <laughs> Let's take a look at it. The film stars Robin Williams as Cy Parrish our parasocial nightmare for the evening. So what is Robin Williams in 2002? Well, he spent the last decade being mostly known for making the cheesiest movies in all of cinema dub. Things like Flubber, Mrs. Doubtfire, Patch Adams and Jack printed money at first, but quickly hit diminishing returns. By the time Bicentennial Man comes out, it's not only the critics complaining that they have to check their blood sugar after watching the film. To say that this particular brand of overly saccharine glorge were a really thing really quickly is an understatement. By 2002, it's difficult for people to remember that shady marketers could have very well tacked on Academy Award winner to Williams' name after his outstanding performance on Goodwill Hunting. Son of a bitch. He stole my life. But he is about to shock everyone by making 2002 his most serious year in film. And then a fun thing happened because my balls went, somebody wants to play! <laughs> Shall we go to phase two? No, do not go to phase two! <laughs> Death to Smoochie drops in March and eases us into the new Robin, by contrasting his previous work through putting some edge to the humor. This is my show! Do you have any idea the power of a condemned man? Do you? Then in May, Christopher Nolan releases Insomnia, a thriller without an ounce of comedy and where Robin Williams plays the villain to critical acclaim and commercial success. Finally, in August, this drops. And having played against type into a fictionalized, lesser version of his career, this time the movie was going to deconstruct his default character type. What really happens when the outcast he used to portray grows up and has no support network, when the imagination runs rampant and there is no cast of quirky characters to bounce off of? This is the man you get. I process these photos as if they were my own. These your uh, relations? Yes. And the cinematography rebels in reminding us how much Sai can be easily dismissed by everyone, his clothing and body language designed to perfectly blend into the background, all of it contrasting with the idyllic life of the people he wishes to join. The Yorkins, the outwardly perfect family living an idyllic, Instagram profile-like existence. And just like Instagram, the pictures only reveal the better side of the story. It's not that the Yorkins' life doesn't match the marketing materials, it's that no reality can. But Sai is comparing the highlight reel to a particularly lonely and mundane behind the scenes. And when he discovers that the real thing doesn't match his expectations... There will be some problems. Director Mark Romanek, who spent the last 15 years directing a lot of amazing things that will get this video copyright claim if I dare to play them, 
re-enter film production with a bang. Especially when we take into account he didn't just direct, but also wrote the picture. According to him, inspired by what he thought was the most interesting person in your average Megamart. In today's world, our concerns with photo privacy are more on the bigger side. Mega corporations using optical recognition and location data to create advertising IDs, AI scooping them and using them for deep learning, cloud services, unilaterally being able to close your account and instantly remove a huge chunk of your history. But these are global concerns. There's something rather more personally terrifying about the old way of photo development. You handed your negatives to some random stranger and asked them to take care of it. All the while trusting that they wouldn't be particularly interested in their content, or worse, the people featured in it. I bet that seems somewhat amusing in our ever lower trust societies. The movie even shows how easy it would be to go undetected just creeping on someone else's pictures. Sai isn't caught because he did anything to get the attention of the authorities or his strange behavior around the Yorkins. He just got sloppy and forgot he had to pay for the additional copies he made. The net clicks all zero out. They always zero out. The problem is, Sai, that the shutdown clicks don't correspond at all. I mean, they don't even come close to matching the amount of prints that we sold. Lumber here wouldn't have been the wiser if he had just put the additional money for the prints on the till so accounts checked out, and he was somewhat more selective about where he daydreams. But he didn't, and so Bill has to go and fire him. I'm letting you go. No. Uh. This, combined with the realization about the Yorkins not being as perfect as he thought they are, goes about as well as you think it would. Because this is one of the movies where you really should watch it, I'll stop just short of telling you how it ends, but suffice it to say there have been hints of Sai's true nature throughout the movie. Much like the detective interrogating Sai, you'll discover that there's just a little bit more to it when you see the whole picture.